Hi, I'm retired NYPD Detective Vic Ferrari, and welcome to NYPD Through the Looking Glass podcast, where you get unique insight into the New York City Police Department. Before we get started, I encourage you to check out my Amazon author page, where you'll find my series of behind-the-scenes NYPD books. The $10 paperback, $2.99 ebook download, including NYPD Law and Disorder. Last week, uh, I interviewed uh, licensed mortician Victor M. Sweeney, and I made a comment about how when they went to pick up a body, a uh, funeral home sent one guy, and I made a comment about, you know, living in Florida, I have noticed that they tend to do things half-assed. And there's been a couple of people on uh, my YouTube channel that have commented like, yeah, Vic, you're absolutely right. Well, here's one more example why things are half-assed done in Florida. The other day, I had a leak in my front lawn, the water line going into my house, so I called the plumbing company. They show up, they dig a hole, they supposedly fix the pipe. They bang me for three hundred and twenty-five dollars to dig a hole and cut some PVC and put it together. Okay, fine. Write the guy a check. They leave. I go to take the garbage out later that night, and I've got like a geyser coming out of my front yard. So something came loose. So I email, I email the owner. He tells me, "Oh, I'll have my guys on it. You'll be happy." Blah 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 blah. I said, "All right." They show up on Thursday morning. Don't really apologize for it, but, you know, it's the workers. They don't care. So they go out there, and I said, do you need me here? I got to run some errands. No, 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 no. We're, we're fine. We'll figure it out. I come back. There's a hole in my yard. Now, the water's turned back on. So there's a hole, and I'm saying to myself, well, they probably left, and they're going to come back later in the day just to make sure 100% that th there's not a leak, and then that'll be done. So last night, I go out. I look. I've got like a hillbilly crime scene in my front yard. They've got five or six pieces of PBC with a rope around it, like so no one will fall in the hole, but no one's going to walk up there. And to, it's Friday night, and to this, you know, to, to this broadcast, they haven't gotten it resolved. So you stay classy, Florida. So from the New York Post, New York City Police Commission has stepped down Thursday amid separate federal corruption investigations targeting Eric Adams and his top aides. So last week, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday night, the FBI raided um, Eric Adams, Mayor Eric Adams, in a circle, including the homes of Edward Caban, the police commissioner, uh, Deputy Mayor for Public Safety Phil Banks, and the townhouse shared by School Chancellor David Banks and First Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright with search warrants, and they seized uh, electronic devices. And then the FBI gave them an order not to destroy any electronic files, including hard hard disk servers preserved for the government because they think there's more evidence of corruption. I'm not an expert of what's going on with this. I mean, I'm living in Florida. I really don't have any inside information. There's a couple of podcasts out there with NYPD guys who have retired just a couple of years ago, and they're all over this. Like, they're reporting it in real time, and I find it interesting. I just haven't had the time to really dive into it. But after these raids happen, what, what's, what seems to be like the current theme, what's driving at least one facet of it, is to own a bar, a restaurant, anything with alcohol and music after dark, you, you need a whole bunch of licenses. And they make you jump through hoops to get them. You need a liquor license. If you're going to have dancing, you need a cabaret license. I'm sure I'm missing things. But you need a lot of stuff. And they're on that. The NYPD is on these establishments because at night people drink. Fights break out. Sometimes someone brings a gun. So they, they don't want these places to turn into dens of iniquity. So you have different units that go and inspect these places. Now, in the old days, it was just the vice unit that took care of it. Now, I'm sure you have the precincts going in there and, and, and checking up on them. Well, these places, if their licenses aren't up to snuff or they have more than X amount of people in there and they're violating a fire code, they get hit with these heavy-duty summonses, and, and the NYPD can shut them down. And again, it was usually handled by vice. Well, what it looks like, what's going on now, and I don't know it to be true, I'm just going by a New York Post article. After these raids, a couple of these restaurant and bar owners are saying, yeah, Vice came or somebody came and gave me a bunch of summonses, and I complained, and government officials from the New York City came to me and said, you know, you should talk to the police commissioner's twin brother, James Caban, who was fired in 2001. He can resolve these things for you for 2500 bucks. I don't know if it, that's exactly the way it went, but <laughs> you can't have the police commissioner's brother running interference and squashing things. I think it's a lot bigger than this. And when the FBI takes your phone, they've already been listening. <laughs> I, so it's probably more, and they've probably been reading your text messages too, but 
these guys got problems. Caban resigned. Um, heads are going to roll with this. It just depends on how much they're going to push it. Now you've got an ex-FBI supervisor running the NYPD. It's a mess, unfortunately. It's embarrassing, but hopefully they're right to ship. I'll report more on this next week when I know more. So this is uh, in the Bronx where I used to work. 58-year-old man was punched in the back of the head by a maniac causing a random assault on a Bronx street last week. Died of his injuries. Daquan Jackson allegedly crept up behind the unsuspecting victim and slugged him, sending him crashing into the street on Jerome and West Marshall Parkway in Norwood on August 4th at around 5 p.m. He was rushed to St. Barnabas Hospital. He died. You know, that happens more than you think where someone just gets punched in the head and it kills them. They get hit in the temple. They get hit the wrong way. Or, and I actually had this happen, where a victim got punched in the face and fell backward and hit his head and died. So think twice before you're going to get into a fight or lose your temper because it could cost you some time in jail. And West Marshall Loop Parkway in Jerome Avenue used to be a really nice neighborhood back in the day. That neighborhood boarded my precinct. They used to pick off a lot of stolen cars up there. It's just sad what's happening to this city. Now, th- th- let's talk about something coming coming full circle. The baby-faced killer who mur- murdered an Upper East Side antiques dealer with a decorative plate, kitchen knife, and maybe a pen previously decapitated another man with a chainsaw. Alex Ray Scott, a 28-year-old trans female from Oklahoma who began transitioning in jail, admitted to the gruesome murders of Robin Skypole, 63 years old, of Broken Arrow, when he was arrested in the New York slaying of Kevin Slavinsky, 64 years old. Details of the Oklahoma murder sur- surfaced Monday at Manhattan Supreme Court hearing where Scott pleaded guilty to second-degree murder as, mul- as, as well as multiple counts of criminal possession. Well, anyway, something like this happened like 25, 30 years ago in New York. There was this guy, I think his name was Grosso. He killed somebody in New York City or New York State, and they were trying him for the murder, or he was convicted of the murder. And even though New York State has the death penalty on the books, they will never enforce it. I mean, it's just, it's a, it, it, they'll never go through with it. But anyway, he's serving jail time in New York, and he confesses to a murder of a guy in Oklahoma which Oklahoma has the death penalty. And from what I remember, this guy Grasso waived extradition and agreed to go to Oklahoma to sue uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oklahoma to do his jail time. And ultimately he was put to death. Um, I'm surprised New York state didn't try to stop him the way things are going. Uh, we just had nine 11 the other day, uh, nearly 17,000 first responders are suffering with cancers and diseases linked to nine 11, two decades later. Some 45,000 people are living with, fit the, with the physical manifestations of the September 11th attacks more than tech, two decades after the tragedy. At least, at least 45,000 civilians and officers from FDNY, NYPD, Port Authority, and New Jersey are suffering from at least one cancer or disease directly linked to the largest attack, a terrorist attack in history. Unfortunately, this is true. I've lost a lot of friends to cancer over the years related to 9-11 illness. Um, and our government was going to defund it. They, they, actually, they, they started up many years ago this thing called the World Trade Center Screening Program. And basically what it was is every year, if you could prove that you were down there and have documentation, every year they'll send you to a place in Manhattan, in New York, you go to a, a nice hospital. If you're living out of state, I know how it works in Florida. You go to some clinic and it's basically a checkup, but they also make you blow into this tube where you think you're going to have an aneurysm. And they take your blood, your urine, they do a chest x-ray, and they screen you for cancer. Well, the federal government was going to end it, and to John Stewart, and I'm not a fan of comedian John Stewart by any stretch of the imagination, but he stepped up, and he had to shame Congress. He went up there and said, well, what are you guys doing? And shamed them into it, and they refunded it for the next couple of years. So it's sad how many people, and, and civilians too, it's not just cops and firemen. I always say that the construction workers, the iron workers, the guys with the trades, the guys that used heavy equipment were heroes as well. Th- there'd still be a pile of rubble down there if it wasn't for those guys. And unfortunately, them and their families are suffering from this. So today I'm going to tell a story from my book, The NYPD's Flying Circus, Cops, Crime, and Chaos. It's a good story. There's way more to it. I suggest you pick up the book or read it on uh, Kindle Unlimited. Pay $10 for a Kindle Unlimited subscription. You can read any book you want unlimited. Um, So it's early in my NYPD career, and I'm a rookie cop. And I can't stress enough 
how when you're a rookie cop in an NYPD precinct, the old timers don't talk to you. And you really want to, you want that acceptance. You, you really want to be one of the guys. You want to get out, asked out for a beer. You don't want to be labeled a snitch or a rat or there's something wrong with that guy. And it's very clickish when you first get in there. And then after a while, you don't give a shit. But early on, there's a lot of peer pressure. So as I stated, I went to this unit very early on. I got Shanghai to a DUI unit. I hated it. The old timers didn't like me and the other young guys for making these arrests. They thought we were making them look bad. Anyway, it was bad. So one day I was doing a day shift and I got paired with this guy that had probably seven or eight years on me. Let's just say his name was Vinny. And in my book, I refer to him as a meatball because he's a round Italian guy. He had like <laughs> Count Chocula hair. Look, look who's turning into Count Chocula. And his whole thing was he was going to drive around all day with the blinders on and write a couple of parking summonses. His whole thing was lunch. That's all he would talk about. When you got in the car with him, what do you want to eat? It's always Italian food. And so anyway, I'm a rookie. We get in the car and he goes, oh, you can drive. I was like, all right, thanks. So th that, that was a plus for me because the old time is never let you have the wheel. So he puts, <laughs> first he's listening to doo-wop, which I mean, you know, that's something my father would listen to. And then Rush Limbaugh came on. Now, many years later, I started listening to it, but not at 21 years old. So I was just kind of like a kid, like, you know, bored out of my mind. And we were going to go down to Hunts Point, which is like the circus back then. And we get on the Bruckner Expressway. And as we're getting off the Hunts Point exit, I'm driving. And I see this 18-wheeler on the service road just come to a screech. Like the smoke comes right out of the back tires. Line. And the driver's side cabin door of the 18-wheeler pops open. And a guy pops out. And there's a struggle. I, I'm, I'm watching the driver trying to kick this young black guy out the side of the truck. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? The guy, black guy falls out of the truck, looks at me, and then just starts running, climbs the fence, and starts running across like six lanes of traffic of the parkway to the other side into Hunts Point. The driver gets out of the truck, and he's covered in blood, been all stabbed up. So I tell the guy, stay there. You got to drive all the way around the Bruckner, and then go cut through Hunts Point Avenue to get into Hunts Point. So the guy had a real lead, but I gave his description. I put it over the air. We get into Hunts Point. I see the guy. Bail out of the car. I'm chasing him a couple of blocks. By the time Vinny got, into the, got out of the car, waddled in, got into the car, he didn't know where I was. I, I grab him. I, I cuff the guy up, and um, I get on the air. The 401 Precinct shows up. I throw the bad guy in the backseat of the car. Where's Vinny? So I go over the radio. I'm trying to raise my partner, and he kind of shouted into the radio, like, I'm going to deal with the complainant, the victim. I said, okay. So I get into the 4-1 with this, this guy and, uh, you know, do all the pedigree at the desk. I put him in the back. Vinny comes in with the victim. I'm talking to the victim. After I get everything squared away, about 20 minutes later, he goes, come here. And he goes, who told you to make a collar? Did you, you didn't tell me you were looking to make a collar. I'm like, well, Vinny. I mean, you know, the guy the guy was getting stabbed up. He was getting robbed. Basically, what it was is in Hunts Point, you get these truck drivers from all over the country that are coming into Hunts Point because you have all the produce places, and now you got the fish market down there. It's a big thing of commerce. A lot of these truck drivers don't know where they're going. So what will happen is guys will hang around Hunts Point, and they'll jump on the truck, and they'll tell they'll explain to the truck driver, how to get into Hunts Point and where Hunts Point Market is, and they'll throw them 10 bucks, or sometimes they'll even help them unload the truck. Well, this guy jumped on the side of the truck. The guy told him to get off. He opened the cab, and he had a screwdriver, and he started stabbing. He's going to rob him. And this truck driver was no... <laughs> That's another thing. The truck driver had a hole in his head. He was shot in the head with a twenty two rifle as a boy, but it didn't kill him because he was bald. And I was like, what is that? He goes, oh, I got shot in the head as a kid. This guy was no joke. Vietnam veteran, tough as nails. He wasn't having it. He wasn't going to get robbed. So Vinny's giving me all this shit about the right. You know, who told you? To, and I'm like terrified. I'm saying, to myself, oh, my God, he's going to badmouth me in the locker room. And But I had a nice robbery collar and, you know, processed the arrest. And then I go back to work. And about two, three weeks later, <laughs> I draw the bad card again. I get paired up with Vinny again. So now I find myself apologizing to this guy. Like when they, they read our names together at the roll call, I just seen him kind of go like this. So I was like, all right, now I got to kiss this guy's ass because he's an old timer or he's a veteran. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to get a bad name for him. So I'm apologizing to him. I'm sorry about last time, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, all right. 
He goes, we got the 4-4 precinct today, which was another rough precinct. He goes, I want to write some parkers. I said, all right. So he goes out and he signs out a, uh, a book of 25 parking tickets. And this time he grabs the keys. So he's going to control the environment. And I really wasn't looking for an arrest. So we get in the car and now I'm trying to smooth things over. I go, how about I buy you lunch? Oh, that's great. So now all of a sudden I'm, I'm a nice guy, right? So we're driving around over by Yankee Stadium. And it's about, I don't know, 10, 11 in the morning. And I think it was off a of Rupert Place. And there's like, there used to be like on the old Yankee Stadium, you had a couple of parks. And um, he pulls up, there's a row of cars parked. And, um, oh, it was alternate side of the street. I know what it was. So you had a car parked on the wrong side of the street. So he rolls up behind it, gets out his book. He starts writing it a parking ticket. And he goes, do me a favor. He goes, just jump out and get the registration information, like the, you know, the date the registration expires. I said, all right. So I get out of the car, right? I walk up to the front of the car and I look. There's four junkies, three or four, I forget, sleeping in the car. They all got the seats back. They're all high and they're out cold, out cold, right? So I run the plate, you know, task force portable. Can you 15 a plate? I run the plate. Five seconds later, you hear auto crime and, you know, auto, whatever, whatever car number I was. She goes, what's your location? So I knew immediately, she goes, that vehicle's 16, which means it's stolen, right? I see Vinny right in the car and his head pick up. And he just, if looks could kill, I'd be in the cemetery. He jumps out of the car. What the fuck? And I'm like, because I don't want to wake these guys up and they're going to start bailing out of the car. So we waited until another 4-4 four, four car came over. They, they were out of their minds, stoned out of their mind. So then we got another couple of cops there. And then we just opened the door, woke them up and locked them up. Bring them into the 4-4, four, four, same shit yelling and screaming and you're you're out of control you're making all these collars you're making us look bad just i mean just tearing into me and so working with vinnie twice i make these arrests and like i said the guy could be bothered with work so years pass so this was like 88 89 so i'm in narcotics this is 93 94 a bunch of years have passed. i had never seen i hadn't seen him again right i'm in narcotics and i worked a double so i get out of, i get out of work at like six seven o'clock in the morning right i'm so tired i'm exhausted i did a double driving home i'm getting off the exit by my house in the bronx and there's traffic and i'm like why would there be traffic getting off this exit at like eight o'clock in the morning right and i'm i'm getting pissed i'm like <laughs> to quote my late father when you'd be sitting in traffic in an accident he'd go Who, whoever's responsible for this they should be dead and i'm just kind of making my way through and then i see polite police activity i see a couple of police cars with the lights on i see and then i see a bunch of rookies which was weird and they're running back and forth and i'm like what is this and there's a checkpoint and i'm like why would they be doing a checkpoint at eight o'clock in the morning like who are they looking for right the nypd got this bug up their ass in the early 90s about doing checkpoints now legally a checkpoint is supposed to be a non-arbitrary systematic roadblock meaning every third car you're going to stop every red car you're going to stop you just can't stop people because they're dirty okay that that's unconstitutional what i see is these rookies running around and the master of ceremonies is Vinny. he's a sergeant now and he's standing there and he's directing these guys like Patton, pull this guy over lock him up and i'm like I, i'm like am i dreaming like what the, what am i looking at like Six years ago, this guy could be bothered with an arrest. Matter of fact, he got mad at me for taking the arrest. He didn't even have to take the arrest. Now he's ordering guys around, lock him up, do this and that. So as I pull up to the thing, I roll down the window and he goes, hey, Vic, how are you? I go, hey, Vin, you decided to join the working class? He goes, yeah, didn't, went right over his head. Right? So I go home and it left a bad taste in my mouth. I'm like, this guy has given me all these years ago for doing my job. Now, all of a sudden, when he doesn't have to put the cuffs on somebody or deal with civil liability if someone's going to sue him or fight with him, now, all of a sudden, the job's on the level now He because he doesn't have to do the dirty work. He can order guys to do what he would never have the balls to do. <laughs> so a couple more years, another five, six years go by, right? Now I'm a detective in the auto crime division. I'm like in my... 17th 18th year right and um in my office i was one of the few guys that knew how to drive the, the flatbed truck i wasn't authorized to drive it they never sent me for training but i grew up in a gas station so i know how to drive a flatbed truck and um 
Another team, which had nothing to do with me, hit this place up in the Bronx. It was, in a ba- it was like a backyard chop shop. They found a couple of stolen cars. The sun was going down, and my lieutenant, I was in the office. I had nothing to do with this warrant, didn't know what it was about. My lieutenant called up, and he goes, do you know how to drive the flatbed? I said, yeah. He goes, do me a favor. He goes, go, go to this location. He goes, I'll pay you a couple hours overtime. He goes, just drag these cars out of here, bring them to the precinct, and then take them out to the pound. I'm like, great, it's overtime for me, right? Drive to this location. And they were in the back, so you got to use a wench or a winch or whatever it's called. You got to pull it off the side of the truck and then hook it and drag it and then slide it up the bed. And I'm in the middle of doing this, and the sun is going down, so you really you want to do this in daylight so nobody gets hurt. And um, who do I see come walking into this backyard now? Vinny, and now he's a lieutenant. And the NYPD, you know, they body shame you. So supervisors. They wear nowadays, it used to, they always wore the blue shirts, but then when we went to the navy blue, then the supervisors have to wear white. If you're fat, like Vinny was, you look like the Michelin man, right? So he's got the white shirt on, and he comes up to me, and he goes, hey, Vic, what are you doing? I said, one of the, I wasn't even the Bronx team. I go, the Bronx team got a search warrant, Vin. I said, I really don't know. I says, I'm, I'm pulling these cars out of here. He goes, well, who will know? I says, I, I, I don't. It's me and my partner. And he goes, well, you know, he goes, he goes, I didn't know about this. So I'm like, Vin, again, I have nothing to do with this. I says, I'll tell you what. I says, so you're not blindsided. I said, let me find out what's going on with the guys that are involved in this when I go to the precinct. I'll get you how many arrests and, and the whole nine yards. I'll put you in touch with the arresting office. I said, but right now the sun's going down, and I got to get these cars out of here. And he gave me a really hard look, right? And him and his driver kind of waddle away. I don't think anything of it. Pull the cars out. Told him to the precinct. I'm helping the guys with the paperwork, right? And um, this young cop comes up to me, and he's like, he goes, are you Ferrari? I said, yeah. He goes, um, I don't want to say the guy's last name, but he goes, lieutenant wants to see you up in his office. I said, all right. I knew who, who was looking for me, right? So I go upstairs, and uh, he's in his office. It's a power move. He's sitting behind his desk, right? I walk in. I knock on the door. He doesn't even pick up his head, and he's writing something down. And he's going to make me stand there. I'm like, okay. So I'm just kind of waiting. And finally he says, um, Vic, you know, he says, I-, I don't like the way you spoke to me earlier. And I was like, Vin, what are you talking about? He goes, you know, you just come in here. You're towing all these cars out of here. He goes, did a search warrant. I don't know about this. Blah, 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 blah. And then you high hand me. And I go, oh, oh, Vin, with all due respect, Lieutenant, I said, I explained to you I know nothing about this. I says, and the reason they created Organized Crime Control Bureau is to put a barrier between patrol cops and what's going on in the street. I go, we don't have to tell you that we're doing a search warrant in here. I said, but that's not my problem with you. I says, for whatever reason, you have a problem with me. He goes, I want to talk to your supervisor. I said, okay. So I go downstairs. I call my lieutenant, which if you read my book, Grand Theft Auto, the NYPD's Auto Crime Division, Chumley, we used to call him Chumley, my lieutenant, because he looked like Tennessee Tuxedo's sidekick. He had the dyed, bushy mustache, very crotchety old Irishman, very difficult guy to work for. But as much as he would screw with us, he didn't like anybody screwing, screwing with us but him. And this guy, Vinny, was way out of bounds. So he shows up to the precinct, and uh, I explained to him. He goes, really? I said, yeah. I says, He said, you know, we can't just come in here and make ser- do search warrants. And he goes, rolled up. He always... Chumley dressed like he dressed like he bought all his clothes from an Army Navy store. And he always wore flannel, so he rolls up his sleeves. And he was an older guy. He took the <laughs> he took the steps like two up, going up the stairs. Right. So what winds up happening? He's up there for a half hour. He comes back downstairs, and I go, "What happened?" He goes, "I set him straight." He says, "But you got an enemy." He says, "So what I suggest you do is stay out of this precinct." I go, "Well." I says, I'm a Manhattan guy. I says, this is a Bronx precinct. So he goes, yeah, I know. He goes, but you have a habit of making collars everywhere. He says, just stay away from this guy. He goes, because if he, if he can stick one in your ass, he's gonna. I said, fair enough. I, I, I appreciate it, Lieutenant. So I thought that would be the end of Vinny. So late, like a year before I'm going to... Re- now, Vinny had more time than me. A year, it was either my last year or the year before I retired. I'm dating this girl. And um, she, she was meeting her girlfriend out for dinner drinks and then they were going to have dinner and she goes why don't you stop by the restaurant later she goes a couple of their husbands are going to show up i don't like getting blindsided with people i don't know it's not that i'm not social i'm actually my my latest book that i i'm i got coming out in a couple of weeks 
there's a chapter in there called Can't We All Just Get Along? And it's about people think you're going to get along with every NYPD member, and you're not. It's just one big dysfunctional family. And um, I said, all right. So it's this is a restaurant in the Bronx, famous Italian restaurant. And I sit down, and my ex-girlfriend's there, and a couple of the guys are there. And she introduces me to them. And I'm like, where is this guy? She goes, oh, he's going to be here. And so the guy's wife is, oh, you must know my husband. And when she said his name, I was like, Oh, yeah. I mean, what am I going to do? His wife doesn't know. She must think he's great. She doesn't know he's an asshole. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's great, right? He's working in the precinct. He shows up in the restaurant in his uniform. So he's going to take his meal in uniform. I never did that before in my life. Comes in, you know, to show off his uniform, and and he looks at me. It was the most uncomfortable 45 minutes. I was like, hey, Vin, Vic. And I told, so afterwards, I told my girlfriend, I was like, I was like, he must be he must be swearing at his wife next time you get the guy's name before you drag me into a restaurant. So in my book, The NYPD's Flying Circus, there's way more to the story. But each time I deal with him, it's like the meatball returns, re- return of the meatball. It's kind of like the Star Wars thing because there's a lot more to it. But it's the truth with the NYPD that... Guys that, you know, the biggest zeros, guys that never did anything, the second they get promoted, the job's on the level, and they, they want to run around and kick ass and take names because, again, they don't have to spend the time in court. They're not going to get sued. They throw everybody else under the bus. So, like I said, in the coming weeks, I'm going to have a new book out. Here's the cover called NYPD Presumption and Dysfunction. As you can see, the guy in the end <laughs> looks like someone that would get at an NYPD promotion ceremony. Everybody looks one way. He looks different. Um, I appreciate all the support you got and your, and your positive comments on my YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. And as always, I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially my listeners in Denver, Colorado, Lehigh Acres, Florida, Stephen, Minnesota, Montgomery, Alabama, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and Pike Road, Alabama. The reason I laugh, when we were kids, my parents bought land in Lehigh Acres, Florida. They held on to it for 40 years, and and they sold it for less when they paid for it. If you work in law enforcement and have an interesting criminal background, please drop me a note on Twitter, Instagram, at VicFerrari50. If you're watching this show on YouTube, please, please, please hit the subscribe button. If you enjoy the content, check out my Amazon author page. Type in my name, Vic Ferrari, like the car, where you can preview all my Amazon. NYPD books for free, including NYPD Law and Disorder. Christmas is coming. I know it's September. It's a $10 stocking stuffer. Just throw it in there. Thank you again, and I'll see you guys next week.